Falling Walls Circle, Challenges and Foresight. Welcome to the Falling Walls Plenary Table, Transatlantic Science Bridge in Key Science and Technology Developments. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Eric Isaacs, president of the Carnegie Institution for Science, and I'm delighted to be here uh, on behalf of both Carnegie Science and DACI, and Director Helmut Dosch, who's here. Um, I'm honored to, uh, to welcome you to this plenary table discussion, a discussion on transatlantic connections in science. This panel had its origins in, um, in our inaugural uh, transatlantic big science conference that was held last year in DC uh, in last fall. And the conference was inspired by this idea that, that as science gets bigger, more complicated, we have to keep reinforcing this idea and advancing the idea of, of international and global collaboration. Now, it's true that we've been collaborating for very many decades around the globe, which is fantastic. But I think in particular, the last few years has made it very clear to us that unless we keep reinvigorating those collaborations and innovate and create new types of collaboration, we end up stalling out and could even Re revert to more of a national approach to science. So we're here to discuss that today. Uh, the conversation is designed to continue the conversation we started last year, and we hope to continue this again in the future. So we'll begin uh, with a short and I hope really lively uh, conversation. It's going to be about 45 minute conversation. And then we'll have questions both from people here in the audience as well as for people who are attending virtually. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, my panel here. I'm very excited, this exceptional group of people. And I'll just go, I'll go around the table. Uh, to my right is Yonki Kim. She's the incoming president of the American Physical Society. Cornelia Dens, who's president of the Physikalisch-Technische Bundesanstalt. Thank you. Um, we have, uh, we have um, Asmaret Berhe, who's the current director of the Office of Science at the Department of Energy. Uh, and Eric Vilner, who's the DACI chief technology officer and the delegate of the Directorate for Innovation. And we will be joined by Maria Lepton shortly, and she's president, as many of you know, of the European Research Council. So as we begin the panel discussion, I'd like to frame a couple of high-level questions, and then we'll go around the table, start the conversation with directed questions. So first, I'd like to sort of frame this thing by asking the, the general question, what are, what do you believe are the most urgent big scientific questions and challenges that should be addressed or have a huge advantage by being addressed by international cooperation? And I expect, given the panel, we're going to hear from basic science like particle physics and cosmology all the way to more translational work like energy, water, like uh, machine learning and, uh, and biomedicine. Uh, so what we'd like to do is start with Dr. Wilner. Uh, and perhaps you could tell us, in the context of these questions, how, uh, how you at DAISY are thinking about addressing these questions and how you think about international partnerships and develop them for the betterment of, of humankind. Well, first of all, DAISY is uh uh, science center with long history in building big infrastructures like particle accelerators and use them for uh, particle physics experiments or using light out of accelerators uh, for experiments um, making the nanocosmos uh, visible and, and understanding the, the structures and dynamics and materials. And um, I think uh, as such we have long history in cooperation especially with uh, US um, building these infrastructures is highly uh, complex. Uh, we need a lot of expertise. And joining for joint forces there is very important to, to get it done and to, to be successful at the very end. And of course, the world is getting more complex and challenges um, are increasingly demanding, which means it is even more uh, important to collaborate, uh, especially between uh, Europe and the US. And, and the, the countries um, beyond the Atlantic. And uh, it's, it's more complex, which means we have to fight for it and we have to discuss it, how to do it. And if you see the challenges, for example, fighting back climate change, um, you know, uh, avoiding the next pandemic situation and stuff like this, it's really important that we keep that up. And there are three reasons why it's important for a, for a center like DAISY. One is, it's part of the creativity process in science to meet other people in different perspectives, which helps to have the best ideas. 
Second, we need um, speed in order to address the challenges out there, and speed is uh, achieved by having different perspectives in a creativity process. And third, and this is what we see in the world, that people get like more and more protective and see different minds uh, critical. And this is something we have to train the young people as well to meet on other cultures, different um, perspectives, and this is another aspect which is very important of a transatlantic cooperation. Thank you. Uh, Amrit, you're a head of Office of Science. You think very globally about science. Uh, this, this meeting, in particular this panel, was originally established as transatlantic, uh, but you think much more broadly than transatlantic. So maybe you can say a few words about how you, the Department of Energy, think about where you want to engage and how you want to engage on a much broader level to solve some of these big challenges we're talking about. Indeed. So where we sit in the Office of Science, I think for clarity's sake, we are the US's largest supporter of basic research in the physical sciences. In addition to being a major funding agency for science, and particular basic science, we also run multiple national laboratories and, and some of the big science projects, if you will, many of the notable big science projects in the US. That means we recognize very well that for advancements of the ideas that we, we work on, that our scientists work on, um, international collaborations and partnerships are key, uh, as Eric said, to really make sure that the science stays forefront. Uh, but in many cases, we also have to think about big facilities and infrastructure that we have to support and build. And it's not always easy to make to, you know, for one side or another alone to afford many of the big science experiments and that we want to do, big, big infrastructures that we want to build. So partnerships with like-minded um, uh, nations and, and um, you know, this very long trusted partnership that the U.S. has had with Europe in, in particular is extremely important, in my opinion, and one that we continuously have to think about. Um, you know, one would argue that as far as society is concerned, some of the me immediate challenges that, that science has to contribute to addressing might be things like food security or climate change, or energy related topics, or AI as it's clearly become a, a priority these days. Uh, but I would argue from the perspective of the office science that the solutions for a lot of these problems lies in basic science. Yeah. And so as we're doing this, we have to be really make sure that we're focusing on basic science and expanding the basic science partnership with as many partners as possible. And preferably even thinking beyond just Europe and North America with like-minded partners that we could see um, even just in other parts of the Atlantic. <laughs> so I, I want to just ask, follow up on, with both of you, since you both run or involved in, in large running not large national facilities uh, and programs uh, that are largely, in the case of you, it's EU funded, in the case of you, it's US funded. So how do you think about this? You, know, you talk about climate change, you talk about you know, development of technology. How do you, it, briefly, how do you think about managing for the taxpayers at the same time you're managing for a global outcome in science? I think in many ways the interests are aligned because for both perspectives we have to keep pushing the frontiers of knowledge forward. And doing so helps from a, you know, the global science perspective, as well as making sure that uh, we're being responsible stewards of the taxpayer dollars that we're receiving to support the science. Well, it, in the case of DAISY, it's even more complex because we are German funded, which means, uh, of course, uh, we are an international lab with German tax money, um, which means that we have to fight for the general idea of science, but at the same time we have to think about how to create impact for the society in Germany, Europe and the world. And this is something I think is the duty for a tax paid um, center like DAISY. Thank you. Cornelia, uh, this sort of follows from that. Um, what do you think are the main barriers to this kind of global, global cooperation and how do you see sort of breaking those, how do you how do you bring those walls down? Yeah. If you think of the history of Atlantic Bridges, it started off with a very critical situation and there was a lot of creativity and solutions needed and it was a, a strong trust that people over the Atlantic come together to serve a city that is, was under um, occupation. So when we now reinvent this Atlantic Bridge and bring it to the 21st century, then it's about also that we need to have trust and I think 
PGB, Physikalstation Bundesanstalt, is one of the national metrology institutes, which are worldwide in every country. But when we look at those that are on the eye level, of course, the US National um, uh, Institute, the NIST, is very important. And because people have trust in metrology, that in, in everyday life, measurements are there and um, help them in everyday life to have trustful data. The same is the trust between the different regions. And this is based on many historical parts where we work together on basic fundamental questions like time or mass, but also nowadays, for example, on energy questions or digitalization. But we see also as government institutions that our governments try to see in the global crisis that they need to be sovereign, that they need to be resilient, and sovereignty and resilience often hinders to work together more. So my pledge is to think more about trust, to think about trusting each other on an eye level, work together, and bring together forces for the big challenges, which are, in fact, the climate crisis, but also all the steps we need to do to digitize everything we have in, in our science, especially looking at good data and good artificial intelligence. And I think there we can join forces to be together mm -hmm. on a global way. And transatlantic Europe and US are the ones that are looking at the same spirit in this direction. Yeah. And that needs to be broken up, and we should not refrain to our countries, ourselves, and be sovereign and um, block each other. So I just want to come back to a word you use, trust. It's sort of a many level. First of all, trust is a complicated word, but it, it, the trust between two nations or globally is multi-layered, too. So you have trust at the governmental level, you know, sort of you know, president or CEO to CEO. What can, what can scientists and science leaders like yourself do as, as scientists to, to build, to help build that trust? Science diplomacy, for example. I mean, do you see that as a, a reasonable tool to gain trust? I'd also, just a, 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 sort of a little bit aside, but part of that is, you know, topics are very different too, right? If we talk about quantum computing versus we talk about particle physics, there's a different level of, sort of let's call it trust, or trust in the ability to collaborate. So do you have thoughts on how we as scientists or the science leaders here can Advance that I think idea the of trust. scientific language is the same in most countries. Of course, we have different native language, but yeah. talking about science, natural science, engineering means that we have a certain level of understanding, a level of approach we have in common. And this already gives some trust. And then if you communicate the all the time and communicate together which are the challenges and how we resolve it, if you put together the ideas, then there is trust about that everybody can contribute something to the solution that another partner cannot, and together we are much stronger. And that's also a trust in science that comes from the same language we are speaking. Thank you. Young Ki, yes. so you're a particle physicist who have both done the physics in multiple uh, facilities around the world. You've also operated and ran big facilities like Fermilab. What lessons can we learn? Because those are all international, mm -hmm. like CERN, like Fermi. The, the work you do is almost entirely global. What can you learn from that, those interactions, building, you, you, you did this at Fermilab, building on those kinds of relationships that are global, and, and how would we use those ideas, and what lessons can we learn for sort of future collaboration, perhaps in other areas, like, like biomedicine? Mm -hmm. Right. Yes, uh, I'm an experimental particle physicist, yeah. as you introduced. Um, so first of all, you know, our questions uh, require very complex and large facilities can be only done uh, by a global effort, not by a single region and uh, country. Uh, examples are Large Hadron Collider at CERN, and, and there's uh, uh, the uh, very intense uh, beams of neutrinos and muons at Fermilab, that's another accelerator, uh, the facility. And in Japan, there's a precision uh, collider and also intensive beams. So these are all done by uh, the uh, collaborative efforts uh, across the world. One thing that this is our necessity to do our science, we need a collaboration. Uh, this doesn't come just, uh, you know, just one day, let's trust each other and, and do it. It comes from many decades of our building trust among each other. It was not easy. We, some cases are failed and, and, and et cetera. So, for example, you know, I studied uh, three and a half decades ago as a graduate student uh, working in Japan. It's like 60 f physicists from four countries. And then later on, Fermilab experiment, you know, 20 countries, uh, the uh, 
starting with 200 people to 600. Now, Atlas uh, experiment the sun or CMS, a similar scale, start with 10,000, I mean, sorry, 1,000 to 3,000 uh, from more than 40 countries cut, spanning all the continents. So this, uh, the, uh, the trust building is uh, very important. And we also had a lot of effort to uh, long strategic planning each country or region uh, so, of course, in the global context, so there are our priori priorities, especially large-scale projects, we have to have a common uh, priorities. So uh, that's an important step. Uh, we, you know, trust is a very important uh, trust among uh, the uh, scientists from different regions and countries important uh, for transparency, uh, good communication, and also, uh, the, uh, to be reliable partners, uh, we have to commit long-term financial and technical uh, commitment. That's very important. I think also uh, we learned that uh, in, in good collaboration, uh, from the beginning of the project, uh, we have to have a share the responsibility and, and uh, uh, the uh, shared ownership and, and governance. So that's very important from the beginning. Also, uh, having uh, equi equitable, uh, as much as possible, equi equi equity uh, issue, and, and ethical standards are quite important so that we all yeah. follow the values. So these are very important on, in, in addition to all the strategic planning. So, uh, thank you. Um, so, I'm going to come back to you, as Marit, based, again, maybe keeping this trust idea open. Ah, welcome. <laughs> welcome. Um, I'll come to you in one second, okay. Okay, so, um, uh, Dr. Lepton has just joined us. Thank you for joining us, and um, we'll get to you in a minute. She's president of the European Research Council, and um, I mentioned this already. So, the question I wanted to ask you, because in your portfolio at, in, in, at DOE, you have particle physics, and I think particle physics is a great example because no one's too worried about, you know, it's, it's open science, it's open basic science. How do you think about building that trust, and, and how do you even think about sort of the, the guardrails when you start talking about translational work? So you talk about battery research, you talk about solar research. We all want to share it. On the other hand, there are financial and security issues around that. So how do you think of it? It's a bit more sticky, I think, than talking about cosmology or particle physics. So how do you at the Office of Science think of that? Indeed. Um, I think trust is a very important um, and interesting way to think about this, right? Because scientists, generally speaking, in our work, um, we, we use trust in our everyday examples. We trust scientists to deliver the work um, ethically, done with the highest quality possible. We trust peer reviewers to give ethical and productive and constructive feedback. Um, we trust each other in, in every possible way that you can imagine that we do science. Um, and a big part of that is not violating that trust, of course, right? And in some ways, this trend translates to what we're talking about when it comes to research security. Because you know, agencies like mine have broad portfolios, um, and in many ways, the intellectual, um, kind of, the intellectual component of the work, if you will, that you do at particle physics or some of the programs covered in our basic energy science portfolio that might include um, more um, kind of applied or at least closer to, to getting into the apl application space, work with batteries or other things. Um, require that we trust the people we're engaging with, um, especially at that fundamental level. Um, this is why partnerships with trusted partners, um, like many countries in Europe that we've engaged with over the years, become incredibly valuable, because we want that science vetted by as many people as possible. We want that science to be the highest quality we also want to make sure that the hard work that many people have put in and the financial investments that the taxpayers have made is not abused um, by you know, actors that do not abide by that same level of trust that we all uh, depend on. So it's a bit of a obviously harder to measure, and it requires long-term commitment on all sides to make sure that it's functioning very well. Um, but we have to, at some level, think about who do we trust and who could we work with and who has not violated that trust in many ways, right? So, Maria Lepton, thanks for coming. Appreciate you having here. You have, you have a microphone there. We all have these head things. I have a question for you. So we have been discussing, basically, these big transatlantic challenges, thinking more broadly even than just transatlantic. Um, and, of course, talking about, we started talking about trust because thanks to you, but, but we would like to ask you, as someone who's led the, the European Research Council, how, what, what topic, what areas do you think are most ripe 
now and in the future for global types of interactions? And where might you shy away a little bit where national interests or EU or, or, or you know, interests come into play? How do you think about that, that, that balance? Well, first of all, apologies to everyone. <laughs> Really sorry. We're glad you and, made it. Uh, not only apologies, but I'm sad to have missed the first half of this discussion. Um, well, I think the trust question, the, the trust point, is actually the most important. And I don't think it's, it's area specific. Of course, everybody is worried that our, uh, you know, the edge we might have in whatever it might be, whether it's batteries, whether it's AI, whether it's, it's, it's a vaccine or whatever, that others are going to steal it um, and, 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 and run with it. But I, I don't think it is like that. For anything where we're really, really, really at the forefront is we, meaning any nation, any group, is stuff where we've been working on for a long time where it's not clear whether it was going to lead to something. Anything that's right to be deployed is hardly secret anymore. So, I mean, I was, I was on, a, on, a, on, a, on a board the other day where uh, in, in some areas it's getting very hard in medical uh, research to get patents anymore because, um, because of various complications. And so the idea of this group was, it doesn't matter. We don't patent. Let the others use it. By the time they use it, we've already thought about the next point. So I, I think that trust is more important. You um, trust your cooperators, your colleagues, to um, behave responsibly. And you share, because you always get Mm -hmm. more back than you give. And this, this fear of other countries stealing, I mean, if we put measures in place to build borders, then it, it's, gonna be, it's gonna be warfare either way. Then they'll, un, anybody who wants knowledge will get it, you know, in the worst case without our knowledge. So better talk. So I, I don't think there's a distinction between fields that need to be protected. What needs to be done is for everybody to work at the forefront of science and share. I mean, do you feel, can I push up? Oh, wait, you go ahead, Cornelia. Yeah. I think sharing was something we did for a long time, and we did it together in different constellations, in big facilities or in national metrology institutions. But now, the grand challenges we are facing now are more complex. It's more like systems that connect different energy um, structures, different regenerative energies. It's climate change with a lot of variables or is digitization where AI is interacting with systems. So I think it's more co-creation we need to do now because one unit might be too weak to solve everything and if we can put together the different expertise and put them together, maybe then we can tackle these grand challenges with the systems. So maybe this is a new perspective. And we talked about Europe. You said Europe should be larger sort, but also from the European side, I think the transatlantic side has the US as a very trustful partner, but it has others too. It's Canada, but it's also Middle and Southern America, where also the states are struggling to, to cope with the energy and climate problems. And I think so it's more co-working and co-creation because the problems are so big. It's more resolving big systems that are interconnected, and everybody should contribute to it. Did you want to yes. respond? That's, that's, of course, the positive aspect of it. And I fully agree with you. I heard more a question about the potential negative. Maybe that's because I've been brainwashed to hear that question, because everybody um, has these scares and wants to be competitive. You're talking about actually collaborating to solve problems, and that is an absolute must, and that has to be done. But that's n that, I don't think, is so much at the fundamental research level, but at the uh, taking the solutions that we could implement um, and taking the knowledge that we have gained, um, hopefully not in secrecy, but we're sharing, to, to deploy it. And there we could really use more uh, insightful and foresightful uh, methods of collaborations. It's not something that we funded in the past, you know? Sorry. Collaborative research, we have funding. I see the head of the HFSP there, you know, one of the biggest really transnational uh, funding, uh, funding organizations. So that was there, and I think we just don't have the mechanisms uh, for what you're presenting in a positive way. Yeah. Eric. Well, I highly appreciate the topic of trust because it's, I mean, trust is really important, um, but not only among scientists, because as you said, like we have the same language, we know each other, we meet each other. 
I think what's important, and I give you an example. I mean, if you if you cooperate, for example, in um, you know finding the next battery technology or solar, we had a great panel here about solar energy as well. Um, and then in Germany, we have a discussion, for example, that we do the basic science in a very excellent manner, and then it goes to U.S. and gets scaled in business. So we do have the, you know, we, we, we have to make sure that we don't lose the confidence of the society that we will handle the whole pipeline of innovation at the very end in our system. Uh, although working together from the beginning to the, to the very end, and this is something we really need to manage professionally and very, in a very simple manner to not lose speed. And this is something we need to incorporate in our work as well in the scientific area. So I, I want to push back on a little bit. I appreciate the very positive tone, and, but you said something which, which I think is important here, which is, and it was in the last discussion on solar yeah. panels, it's been on every discussion about technology, which is scalability. So if you really want to solve the energy problem or the climate problem, you need to scale. You can't just make 15 batteries, you've got to make billions of batteries. And coming back to you again, um, you know, it, it's true that share, being very open at basic science is great. Let everyone figure out how to use it. But to be able to actually do something at scale, you need to be able to scale it with resources. And if you don't have the resources, it's going to go nowhere. So, you know, in, in, and of course, I'm in, the US, I'll, I'm in the U.S. We hear the battle all the time about China, about, you know, et cetera. How do you think about that? Because, because I totally, am, I'm a physicist. I believe in open science. But I also ha know that... Most countries, the EU as well, have to worry about scalability. And if you want to scale and manufacture, it's just money, but if you want to scale, you need resources. So how do you think about that? I mean, I agree with you, of course, you can't scale without resources. Yeah. And you, but um, in many ways, I think I'll try to not speak for others in, in my organization because I'm in charge of basic science and yeah. not the application of it, as you very well know. But, but in, just like Eric said, I think uh, there's an important point here, right? We are uh, stewarding public resources, and that, steward, that responsibility that we have is to make sure that the innovations that are derived for, from you know, these public investments for basic science are utilized in a very responsible manner and are not going on to benefit somebody else um, and leaving behind the very public that made the investment um, in, in, in terms of advancing the science and the work. And so that's really just the reality of the world that we live in. Some of the, you know, I'm all for open science. I think every scientist out there would argue that science is enriched when we have open collaborative systems that are incredibly important. And, and I wish we lived in a situation where um, nobody's abusing that trust, if you will. But unfortunately, that's not the reality, and that's important in particular for things that are closer to the technology space and more sensitive technologies that could be abused. And, and we want to make sure that the right protections are, are in place to protect the public's investment in, in STEM, but at the same time, without compromising the openness of the scientific enterprise that we value so much and is a cornerstone for so much of the advancements that we all care about. So you had something to say, yeah. and I want to go to Yoki. Yeah. So, a very good point. Me too, of course, I'm basic yeah. science. I think there, there, there are two different issues here. One is solving the big problems. I mean, a COVID vaccine doesn't help if it's distributed in only one country, and climate change is impossible to do in only one country. The benefits, so those benefits, getting a vaccine or turning back climate change or protecting the earth against whatever climate change we can't change back anymore, that is everybody. There is benefit is everywhere, regardless of where the science is done. The companies that make whatever needs to be made, the financial benefit, that's different. So I think one has to distinguish that. And another important point about trust is, of course, that Trust has deep cultural backgrounds that are different in different communities, even in very small communities. You know, the research community on mouse genetics is very different from the research community on worms. Uh, so everyone has to learn to trust everywhere. And when it goes between, not even between scientists in different countries, but between science and industry, then one has to learn a completely new set of skills. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Young Key. Yes, I mean, I totally agree with you. I mean, just want to point out, as I said earlier, that trust, it takes a long time. And that's why in our field, we started even small scale, learn how to do with a small group. And, and 
uh, learn lessons and make it bigger and bigger. One comment uh, I want to um, bring up is, you know, we talked about uh, limited resources around the world. That's why we have to do collaborate. And of course, money is a big uh, one of uh, such resource and, and uh, technology, etc. But I want to point at the uh, uh, people. Uh, also a uh, very important resource, especially if you think about the future. So uh, the, how uh, we want to uh, maximize all the brains of the uh, workforce around, uh, uh, across the, the world, especially global south, and how we uh, can give uh, enough opportunities so that uh, the, uh, for the world <laughs> in the future. So I want to just point out the importance of uh, workforce. Thank you. Cornelia. Yeah, when, when it comes between the, the edge from science, basic science to technology, then we maybe all have some sort of yeah, stereotypes. So typically, many people think in the US there's a big industry and many things are brought to, to industrial products. But when we look, for example, for the semiconductor industry, for the chip industry, there's a very strength in Europe. And on the one hand, we could say that also transatlantically we can exchange. Every country can build it on its own again then everybody has the same technology. But I think that's a risk, because at the same time, worldwide, in a global world, other areas may just pass by because we are occupied in competing a little bit and becoming on both sides on the Atlantic better in these technologies. And maybe then it's really wise to think also for technologies how to team up, how to put forces together so that these technologies are still there for benefit for all of the world and not being in countries that somehow have different ideas about it. And that's a risk maybe for the future that between the US and Europe there is a competition about some technology. So together we could more quicker come to a higher technology level and also are not leaving this to other countries. Let me, let, I'll continue a minute. I just wanted to follow up with that because um, when we talk about the big challenges, we can talk about the pandemic. We were, we were on the trailing edge of that, right? Something happened and we scrambled and you know, ev everyone did what they had to do. It was just all hands on deck. And that was, I think it was a marvelous example of how it could work. Uh, another, ex but it was, it was that. It wasn't we were prepared as a, as a globe, as a, as a nation, we weren't prepared in the US. But um, you know, I also, another example is in very basic side on telescopes. The Europeans are building a telescope. The Americans are building a couple with an international. And, and so what I'm gonna ask is how do you, what would, how would you advise a, an early career technical or scientific person, if they, if they have an idea for, for a major vaccine or if they have an idea for a major project, how do they get involved in something which is global? I mean, maybe this is something you've thought about at Fermilab, but I, we seem to be chasing, like ambulance chasing, instead of getting ahead of that. So what, what would you, how would you imagine a structure or a, you know, even maybe conversations like this go beyond the conversation? How do you make that concrete? Does anyone have any thoughts on that? I mean, I could start. Um, a big part of this is obviously opening opportunities for the next generation science leaders to, and not just in their training, but also in their practice, to obviously be able to have the connections and the networks that are so valuable in STEM that would allow, uh, allow them to play active roles um, in the networks and communities that they could, um, that they could have, a, a, that they could take their ideas to and really um, take it to the next level. But I really want to emphasize what Yang Kim said, Yang Kim said a minute ago. Um, and that is, you know, a big part of open science and collaborative science and not closing borders and not, you know, kind of building that trust is demonstrating, right, that we are willing to share the science in an equitable manner. And it wasn't until very soon, obviously, where we moved on, m moved in a more aggressive way, both in the U.S. and in North America, about openness of the ba even the basic science work that we do, uh, which was really out of reach for most of the world outside the two continents. Um, and that, to me, is an important part of how we support the building of the, the nurturing of the next generation of scientific workforce across the globe in places that don't necessarily have um, as much access to the basic science um, tools, resources, and, um, and even the, the science itself um, in a timely fashion, right? And so, yeah, I think it's extremely important that we're really thinking about the entire innovation chain, but also a wider community. How do we expand, if you will, the access to basic science um, in a way that empowers the younger folks, the next generation folks, to be able to play more meaningful roles um, in leading the world as they should very soon? 
Eric, you had a, you, Eric, you had a question. Well, uh, directed to that aspect, I think young people, and, and I have a lot of interviews with young people um, coming to DAISY, and they say, um, they, they think more in ecosystems than in, in topics, right? They, they don't want to be pure basic scientists, they want to generate impact. Uh, no matter how, no matter when, they want to generate impact. And so the question is, how can we set up a structure where young people can do basic science, but generating short and medium term impact at the same time? And this is a duty we have as scientific community to think about career path, which is more hybrid than it used to be. Uh, and especially when it comes to uh, international corporations, um, not only thinking about open science, but also about uh, open innovation. And I think this will generate a whole new generation uh, contributing to the, uh, to the challenges we have. Any other comments about that? I'm a bit worried about, I mean, interesting, very interesting points, and I, I, I do think we have to uh, engage more and give more power to the younger people, especially if we remember that Darwin, for example, was 27 when he sailed across the ocean, and his captain was, too, leading those boats. I mean, unbelievable, and we don't even give people PhDs at the age of 27. Um, so, don't go uh, there. But, but um, what I just heard that concerned me was guaranteeing impact. I think we can't do that. I mean, you don't know. You don't know the whole point about research, about fundamental research, even if it's towards applied, uh, an applied goal eventually. You can't guarantee an impact. You have to be open-minded. You have to um, accept failure, actually. So just maybe you meant something just, different, but it's, it's not about that's guaranteeing true. impact. It's about like enabling impact. It's like uh, uh, forming an ecosystem where they can have impact if they want, and they can to go towards impact. Yeah. Uh, this is what we have to do. It's not a guaranteed yeah. impact. No, of no course. we. Yeah. That's your important. Word. We, yeah. I think we have to be very clear about that to the to the yeah. younger people. Yeah. yeah. Maybe the yeah, world I agree. is more meaningful, so, meaningful so instead of impact. Asma, and then Cornelia, and then yeah. Yonki. I think Eric uh, uh, s said it very well. Uh, I think what young people are looking for, towards us for is making sure that their careers in science that they love, just like we all love science, can actually lead to at least that there is an opportunity that their work can lead to impact. Um, I think it's very fair to say at this point that a lot of earlier career folks are not interested in purely focusing on one area or another for the sake of pushing publications or whatever. They really are way more obviously in um, concern about the state of the world and where things are headed, and they want to see their science knowledge come to fruition in one way or another, and they want to, to have their science careers to have potential impact or contributions that they can make um, in areas that they think are important and meaningful. And I think that's a pretty universal thing at this point, I would argue. So just I'm interject and we'll keep going. The one thing in comment about that is, you know, especially the, the purpose of this discussion in this table is talking about big problems, big science problems. And now more than ever, we're seeing those, right? Whether it's a big machine being built or whether it's you know, a new telescope or whether it's a, a pandemic. And the, the translation between individual minds who have great ideas and, and scaling it is what I'm kind of worried about. And giving someone a runway is great. Letting them succeed is great. But how do they succeed? I mean, if someone has a brilliant idea and it's a $20 billion idea, it, it's got to figure, and it, it, right now it's a very complicated path, that's all I'm saying. If, if, and so it'd be interesting, that's maybe a future discussion at our next Falling Walls conference, but <laughs> Cornelia. Yeah, so, so I agree that I think young people that are in basic research typically are already used to, to move between countries, to have international research, and to have postdocs time at different regions. This is already well established, and maybe they all want to have a meaning. But when it comes to more the bridge to technology, which many young people also want to do, having a sort of yeah, meaning to do something with their research, then there is different spirits at, at both sides of the Atlantic. The American culture of having the possibility to have failure, and failure strengthens you for the next time, is not so much pronounced in Europe. So maybe it's good to learn <coughs> from this structure. And I found your word very um, good to say, we talk about open science, and this is uh, already usual for basic science that we exchange uh, across the Atlantic with many different countries. But having open innovation so that people also can access different innovations and come together to have the same spirit, of failure, of how to produce innovation, how to come to a new idea about uh, intellectual property. 
This can be something we can do together in a new spirit, which helps Europe, but also maybe helps the US to come together. And this is something we have not yet for young people. Yeah. And many of those think of an open world where resources are there for everybody. And this could be a new idea for open innovations. Thank you, Yonki. Yeah, concerning um, our early careers, their interests, uh, so, uh, you know, Eric, you mentioned about impact. Of course, uh, many, uh, you know, students or postdocs or young uh, early careers, they would like to make an impact to the society. So often, immediate impact, they will be able to see that comes to more applied area. But impact could be many different level and different time. Immediate impact and more, you know, our next generation. Some of the very basic one is next, next generation. So we are uh, planting uh, trees for not our generation, but it's really our grandchildren's generation. That's also huge impact. So I think that's something that we should work together, how to communicate that excitement uh, of a impact in all different levels. So depending on what kind of impact they want to make, so they have choices to make. Um, so that's one point I would like to make. Another one, uh, large uh, the project, and etc. something that we learned a lot in the particle physics uh, the field, uh, there are a lot of challenges for the early careers because, because this is a, such a large collaboration how do they really identify their innovation and creativity and visible? Uh, so we are trying uh, many ways, but we are still uh, f have to figure out how to do better. And, and this is again, uh, may not be just on the particle physics field, the future, there might be other large scale facilities and et cetera. Uh, this is a very uh, key issues that we are uh, struggling and finding solution. And, and so keep that in mind for even future projects. So let me um, bring up another question. I think we have three more minutes. Ideally, at this point, we can take some questions from the audience, okay, actually, just, can as I, well. L let me ask one more question, then we'll go out to the audience. Okay. okay. Does the audience have questions? Yeah, they're going to get. So what time do we start now? Uh, ideally, with okay, taking fine. Uh, questions from the <laughs> online audience <laughs> now <laughs> and from. Um, yeah. So yeah, yeah if, you're, if you're watching online, please drop your questions in the chat. And if you're sitting here in person, then please raise your hand. And I see straight off the bat, we've got a question over here in the front row. So if we could get a microphone over and yes, please stand up. Yeah, so it uh, was really great to listen to you how you know this uh, very well established transatlantic bridge can. You know, create new types of cooperation to solve the grand challenges. I, I want to throw to you a question which some of you might not find easy to respond to or to answer. So my question is, you know, how robust this bridge really is, also now and in the future. So I mean, a, a bridge is robust because you have two pillars on the, each side and you know, there needs to be a politically robust pillar, otherwise, you know, you are in trouble. So I think the next reality check for this transatlantic bridge is uh, next year, the election in the United States. You know, I just want to say if this goes wrong, I'm pretty sure that politics is already making arrangement how to react on that. What are we doing? So, are, so what are we doing? So are we keeping our heads low to be below the political radar? Uh, so are we changing from science cooperation to science diplomacy, or so what is our plan? So are we just ex waiting what happens, or do we have a plan? Does anyone want to take that one? Maybe I'll Cornelia? first take a very general answer <laughs> in your picture. If you have a bridge, and this bridge is, um, yeah, one that it lasts for a while, maybe you have always to care for that it's in a new state. And so you have to care for the bridge, and this needs to be from both pillars. So we all have to work on this cooperation. It's, it's not for granted that it stays like that all the time, so we have to work on it. And maybe I add something else. We see on both sides of the bridge that we have strong issues. And one issue that is not a natural science is migration. Migration is also due to our situation in climate and social situations. And in both sides of the Atlantic, if we don't do something, this will increase and this will maybe also endanger our bridge. So in that way, we also need to tackle these questions in order to renew our bridge. And that means looking at the issues where our both countries have threats that may endanger the bridge. Yonki, you had a, a comment. Yeah, Helmut, thank you for the question. 
and bridge can collapse at any time. So I think we have to continue to work on to make sure bridge is strong uh, and strong foundation. I would say that this bridge is so important. We need many more bridges covering the global, uh, especially paying more attention to how, how to engage global south. Uh, with us uh, and how the Asia and other side of uh, the world can join. Because we are dealing with uh, global challenges. It cannot be just done by transatlantic, but it's beyond. So I, we really need a stronger bridge, because still we, we have more work to do to make this strong and, and expand it to uh, globally. I think your point on more, more bridges is important, because no matter what we do, countries are going to go through up and down and yeah. up and down. So the more connections we have. I think that's a really great point. Uh, are there any other comments about Helmut's question? I think on this note, then, um, a question from online. How can we make sure, then, that bridges like these don't become barriers for other nations and instead lift up those other nations? How do we put that into, into practice? Um, I think one important thing to keep in mind is we all strive for excellence in the science that we do um, in each of our nations across you know, the partnerships that we already have, but always keeping an eye towards inclusive excellence, making sure that what we consider partnerships are not exclusionary of people who do not share one factor or another, one variable with us or another. Um, Yankee talked really well about the, the Global South, which is, I think we have to be real, in most of STEM. Uh, we've basically relegated the, the, the task that the Global South can play in terms of application of the science, but not empowering people in the Global South enough to actually be able to generate the science. So the co-creation of the knowledge and co-creation of the inventions have not really been uh, ones that we work towards. And if we really want you know, that bridge to be strengthened, more bridges to be built, we really have to do it right next time. And, and empower people to actually be uh, partners, real partners, in the generation of knowledge and pushing the advancements. Cornelia? I think this, this empowerment has a lot to do with education. And we have to rethink how education can work in a way that very soon in this education there is an instance of co-creation, of participation, because this is important so that in education also the spirit, what is important in cooperation, what is important in scientific interaction, can be learned. And this is something we all have to tackle because this is really in danger of the bridge. The less education is worldwide, the less people can develop and can be reasonable in also scientific paths. Thank you. I think that's all the time we have for questions. So I'll hand back for some okay. concluding thoughts. So first of all, thank the panelists for a terrific conversation. But before we give them a round of applause, uh, a little plug, I hope you can join us next June 27th, 28th, where we'll continue this conversation right here in Berlin, uh, our next transatlantic big science conference. And uh, just a comment that um, you know, I grew up well in the middle of last century, and the big discussions of last century were all about you know, transatlantic big science, what really started last century, were all about uh, the endless frontier, which is still out there. Uh, today, it looks more like what we're looking for is science not as an endless frontier, but has no frontiers. That basically, it's a science that's, that has no boundaries, no frontiers, but is still chasing after the most important problems for humanity. And I think we heard an inkling of that today, and I appreciate all that. Um, I hope everyone will join me in, in thanking our panelists. Let's do a round of applause for our panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And then I also I want to thank Daisy. And, and their contributions, Falling Walls, for hosting this great uh, panel discussion, and the Transatlantic Science Conference Steering Committee who helped organize this group. And thanks again to everyone. Great questions, great interaction, and uh, we'll see you again in June, we hope. Thank you. Thank you.